When we hear survival of the fittest, what do we picture? Is it a big strong bear that towers over us? Or maybe it's a wry sneaky fox that's good at snatching resources and evading predators. Survival of the fittest has begun to evoke a new image, one of vulnerability, sickness, and discomfort. Our traditional understandings of health and fitness are being turned on their heads when viewing things from an evolutionary perspective. For instance, let's take morning sickness. It's generally accepted that morning sickness, or more accurately, nausea and vomiting of pregnancy, shortened to NVP, is perfectly healthy for pregnant women. Why is it, though, that it's perfectly healthy for pregnant women? Typically, Scientists could look at the chemical reactions that lead to experiencing nausea and vomiting, what are called the proximate causes. This type of analysis would show that the release of certain placental hormones correlates with the onset of NVP. But while this answer provides a strong how, it does not provide a strong why. For that, researchers would need to pursue the ultimate causes. Whereas proximate causation explores the immediate underlying mechanisms that result in an outcome, Ultimate causation explores the history and evolution behind an outcome. In this example, NVP would have to be understood as beneficial to the mother and child's evolutionary fitness. Put in other terms, NVP would have to be an adaptation. In 2008, evolutionary biologists at Princeton University asked whether NVP was an adaptation or just a non-adaptive consequence of the strain pregnancy puts on the female body. They concluded that because of the timeline of pregnancy symptoms, it was more reasonably to be an adaptation. First, a woman would get pregnant. That's a given. Second, about five to 12 weeks following her last menstruation, nausea and vomiting would begin. This is the vomiting is especially pertinent because it clears the mother of toxins called teratogens that threaten fetal development. Third, typical pregnancy cravings and aversions would begin. And fourth, nausea and vomiting would stop, presumably as those toxins are less frequently ingested. This theory is also supported by the variations in cravings and aversions from around the world, where different populations would have adapted to different diets. Mothers who experience NVP have better chances of positive pregnancy outcomes, which are be beneficial to both her and her child's survival. The genes that code for NVP would be passed on to future generations following these successful pregnancies. And through this evolution, nausea and vomiting would become staples of a healthy pregnancy. Evolution was first used to assess disease almost 70 years ago. In 1957, George C. Williams used the theory of natural selection to explain how decline from old age could persist in modern populations. His paper, Pleiotropy, Natural Selection, and the Evolution of Senescence, proposed that certain genes could produce invisible or even beneficial effects in younger individuals, but deleterious effects at older ages. Nowadays, the intersection of evolutionary and health sciences is commonly referred to as Darwinian medicine. Here at USF's College of Public Health, dozens of researchers work countless hours exploring health from the evolutionary perspective. I've had the pleasure of volunteering in the Wildman Lab, where we look at the adaptations that different populations have acquired to survive at higher altitudes. But Darwinian medicine has more practical applications that are incredibly useful in understanding our own health. I believe that there are two main lessons we can all take from Darwinian medicine as we assess health. First, our bodies have evolved to maximize survival and reproduction, not to maximize comfort and satisfaction. To illustrate this point, let's talk a little bit more about nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. So, I know, I'm probably never going to get pregnant. That feels like a really safe bet, and about half of you the half with both an X and a Y chromosome, will also probably never get pregnant. However, the vast majority of American women will experience pregnancy. In 2018, 86% of American women at the end of childbearing age had been pregnant at least once. And according to research conducted at the University of Wisconsin, about 75% of American and Canadian women experienced some episode of NVP during their pregnancy. Put in other terms, every year, Four million American and Canadian women will experience nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. That's a lot of people. I've never seen four million people all in one place. It's crazy. That being said, we've already discussed how NVP is beneficial. It's a staple of a healthy pregnancy. Its incidence correlates with successful deliveries and healthy babies. However, NVP is uncomfortable. 
It can be especially distressing for mothers who have to work to support their growing families. So NVP is an adaptation that maximizes survival and reproduction, but causes acute discomfort. Would it be smart then to medicate NVP, an adaptation that originally arose to help maximize our survival, just because it causes us some distress? Generally, the answer has been to let it be. Physicians typically refrain from prescribing medications that interfere with normal NVP, instead recommending lifestyle and diet changes and supplements to replenish what's thrown up. Only if nausea and vomiting persist despite these simpler changes, do physicians consider prescribing diclegis, the only FDA-approved drug for treating morning sickness. With NVP, we refrain from interfering with this naturally acquired adaptation. There are other adaptations, though, that when disregarded, have population-wide consequences. NVP, on one hand, is only between a mother and child. But when talking about something like a fever that regulates our uh, defense to infection, that becomes problematic. We often think that fevers are just our bodies warming up to kill germs. And while it's cool to think of our bodies as ovens that can heat up to burn bad bugs, it's not all that's happening. Research at the Shanghai Institute of Cell of biochemistry and cell biology found that in mice, elevated body temperatures actually correlated with increased helper T cell mobility, which are incredibly vital to a successful immune response. So fevers, much like NVP, are adaptations that help maximize our survival and reproduction, but cause discomfort. Unlike NVP, which only has one FDA approved drug for treatment, you could pick up a bottle of antipyretics, the, the fun, name for fever reducers at literally any gas station. Over-the-counter drugs like acetaminophen and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like the ibuprofen and Tylenol diminish the, body's, the, diminish the efficacy of our body's febrile response. Weaker fevers have been shown to prolong the course of infection, increase mortality, and ultimately lead to more people getting sick. As previously stated, this can be problematic when considering highly infectious endemic diseases such as influenza. According to research conducted at McMaster University in Ontario in 2013, seasonal influenza had about a 5% increase in transmissibility due to the abuse of antipyretics in the United States. 5% may not sound like much, but when considering that annually 10 to 40 million Americans get the flu, that leads to hundreds of preventable deaths annually. However, there's something that we can all do just by rethinking taking that Tylenol for our smaller headaches and fevers, we could all literally help save lives. We'll only be able to achieve this clinically conservative mindset though by remembering sometimes our lives need to be unpleasant for our adaptations to be effective. The second lesson of Darwinian medicine is that our body's blueprint is incredibly old and it changes gradually over the course of generations. Our species, Homo sapiens, has been around for about 300,000 years, give or take. About 6,000 years ago, civilization sprang up in Mesopotamia. In the grand scheme of evolution, 6,000 years is a drop in the bucket. So to an extent, humanity is still well adapted to life as hunter-gatherers. With that in mind, certain adaptations that would have been beneficial on the plains of Africa have become maladaptive today. To demonstrate this, let's talk about pregnancy just one more time. So thanks to the protection secured by NVP, you have a successful pregnancy and now have a baby. Hey, Babies demand time, energy, and money. And for a lot of mothers, that can exhaust them and lead to something called the baby blues. Roughly 80 to 90% of mothers experience some form of baby blues. Whereas 10 to 20% of mothers go on to be diagnosed with full-blown postpartum depression, shortened to PPD. Mothers with less material wealth and social resources are more likely to experience PPD which ultimately results in reduced maternal care for the baby. Tens of thousands of years ago, PPD might have been helpful for mothers who couldn't afford to invest in a child. They would experience depression, and if no additional paternal or social aid arrived, they could totally abandon their kid. That would help them to survive for longer and maybe have more kids upon finding greater stability. We don't live tens of thousands of years ago. But when mothers perceive a deficit in available resources, they still experience postpartum depression. Thankfully, nowadays, there's a greater wealth in resources. 
So that deficit can often be overcome and mothers can continue to support their children without risking their livelihoods. Generally speaking, mental illness can also be understood as the consequence of an outdated adaptation. In his book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, the author, Dr. Sapolsky, clearly outlines how we're constantly inundated with stressors that initiate the same stress response as a vicious lion would on the savanna. None of these stressors pose any actual threat to life or limb, though. So we constantly experience anxiety just to maintain performance in a very demanding world to the detriment of our well-being. Even suicide, a growing epidemic, can be understood as a right pre-programmed physiological response to very, very, very wrong circumstance. An individual who had burdened resources and failed to reproduce might have sought to remove themselves in a tribal setting. That way their genes would survive in their family. This self-sacrificing behavior is called altruism in biology. Nowadays though, we perceive ourselves as hopeless burdens once trapped in social circumstance. Teenagers who are constantly inundated with insane beauty standards wrongly assume that they'll never be attractive or desirable and will never get the chance to have kids. This is leading a rising number to tragically take their own lives. Suicide in the elderly is also increasing, with men over 85 actually being the highest at-risk group. They might instead seek suicide for having exhausted their reproductive potential and now perceiving themselves as exhausting resources. Regardless, this epidemic can be traced back to outdated adaptations conflicting with our contemporary setting. So as I conclude, I'd like you all to please remember, the first lesson Darwinian medicine can teach us is that our bodies have evolved to maximize survival and reproduction, not to maximize comfort and satisfaction. The second lesson is that our body's blueprint is incredibly old and it changes gradually over the course of gen generations. <clears throat> Darwinian medicine itself is the application of evolution in the evaluation of our health. Thank you all for coming to my TED Talk.